A conic section is formed by graphing a quadratic polynomial of x and y equaling 0. It includes hyperbolas, parabolas, up to two lines, circles, single points, and ellipses. Let's say that I want to describe a conic section not by these coefficients, but by some of the points that lie on the curve, simply because it's cooler. The number of required points is the same as the number of free parameters of the equation. The equation seems to have six free parameters, but I can always divide out a non-zero coefficient, let's say the coefficient a, and treat each new coefficient as a free parameter. So there are actually five free parameters. Since there are five parameters, I need five arbitrary points to solve for these parameters in terms of the coordinates of the points using these five equations. However, solving this system of equations looks way too complicated. And even if I did, the result would look too messy and be difficult to arrange to look nicer. Then how can I derive a conic section equation in terms of five solution points and have the equation look nice? And what does nice even look like? To answer that, I'll look at another collection of points in something called the Pappus configuration. The Pappus configuration consists of a set of nine points anywhere on the plane. However, they must follow nine rules that restrict their positions relative to each other. Each rule demands that three certain points are collinear. When three points are collinear, there exists a line that can be on all three points. For example, these three points are collinear, but now they're not collinear since no line can be on all three points. With this, I can start constructing the Pappus configuration. Given these nine arbitrarily placed points, I apply the first rule. This rule restricts points 1, 2, and 3 to be collinear. There are many ways for these points to be collinear, so I'll just choose to move point 2 to be aligned with points 1 and 3. The line marks that these points are collinear. The next rule is for points 4, 5, and 6. I'll choose to move point 6. Next is points 1, 5, and 7. I'll move point 7. Next is points 3, 4, and 8. I'll move point 4. I've applied four rules so far. Note that these rules can be applied in any order, but the order that I'm doing now is best for understanding the Pappus configuration. I'll let the animations quickly do the next four. The final rule is for points 7, 8, and 9. I'll move point, wait, these points are already collinear. Well, maybe it's just a coincidence. I'll scatter the points and try again. Points 7, 8, and 9 are still collinear. It's as if I don't even need the final collinearity rule, since the first 8 already imply it. No matter where all of the points are, as long as the first 8 rules are already there, the ninth rule is always implied. This is what is special about the Pappus configuration, and is called Pappus's theorem. I'll write it like this, where the set with the 9 rules equals the set with 8 rules. If I were to consider a different configuration, with different collinearity rules, and a different number of points. Applying all but one of the rules doesn't always imply that excluded rule. In this case, all of the rules but the rule for points 8, 9, and 10 have been applied. But points 8, 9, and 10 are not collinear. I'd have to first move around many of the points in order to apply that rule. Now that I've shown the visualization of Pappus's theorem, how do I formally prove it? First, I have to formally define what it means for three points to be collinear. Since collinearity involves the positions of three points, maybe collinearity can be quantified as a function of the coordinates based on how aligned the points are. When the points look more aligned, the function value gets smaller. And when the points look less aligned, the function value gets larger. When the points are fully aligned, they are collinear and the function equals zero. Then, what could this function be? One possible function could be the area of the triangle formed by the points since the area decreases to zero when the points become collinear. I won't show the algebraic details, but the area in terms of the coordinates is this. Since I only care about whether or not the function equals zero, I can use a nicer function that would be two times the area to get rid of that one-half factor. Also, the fact that this function could technically be negative doesn't matter, since it still equals zero when the points are collinear. Then, this could be arranged further. To get this, a 3x3 determinant. This form of the area function reveals the truth behind where these points naturally live in. The z equals 1 plane. 
I'll now think of these points as 3D vectors on this plane, where each vector is a column of this determinant. Therefore, if I create a parallel pipette formed by these three vectors, its volume is the determinant. When the points become collinear, the volume goes to zero. I'll notate the determinants of three arbitrary vectors a, b, and c, like this. Now I can algebraically and concisely write the collinearity rules of the Pappus configuration like this. I have to show that the ninth equation is true using only the first eight equations. In other words, I have to manipulate the first eight equations to obtain the determinants of vectors 7, 8, and 9, and show that it equals 0. I'll do this by solving for those vectors in terms of vectors 1 through 6, taking the determinants of them, and showing that it equals 0. This is the Pappus configuration on the z equals 1 plane. I'll start with solving for vector 7 first. There are two equations that contain vector 7 that I can use to solve for it. Visually, these two equations represent two lines intersecting at vector 7, with the other four vectors on their respective lines. There is a visual way to obtain vector 7 in terms of the other four vectors, but the cross products make it hard to work with. Instead, I want to express vector 7 as a linear combination of these four vectors, as you'll see how that'll be helpful later. Since vector 7 is collinear with vectors 1 and 5, and vectors 4 and 2, Vector 7 actually doesn't need to be a linear combination of all four vectors, but only of either vectors 1 and 5, or vectors 4 and 2. For convenience, I'll choose vectors 4 and 2. Then, I'll sub this into the two equations and simplify, using the properties that determinants can distribute over vector addition, and can have scalars factored out. There are determinants that contain two of the same vectors. Visually, when two of three vectors equal each other, their volume, and thus determinant, equals zero. So the second equation can't be used to solve for c and d. However, from vector 7, its z component must equal 1, so I can get another equation. With these two equations, I can solve for c and d and simplify vector 7. Now I can get the same kind of result for vectors 8 and 9, since they come from the same kind of equations. Next, I'll take the determinants of these vectors. I can factor out the three scalars and then expand the determinants since vectors 7, 8, and 9 are expressed as linear combinations. But before I do that, I'll temporarily multiply the scalars to the other side to leave more room for the expanded determinant. Overall, there are 8 terms. I'll do some rearranging, using the property that swapping vectors in the determinants negate them. So swapping twice doesn't change the sign. I find that 3 pairs of terms cancel. Next, I'll use the remaining two collinearity rules. The determinants of vectors 1, 2, and 3 can be subbed into the first term, and the determinants of vectors 4, 5, and 6 can be subbed into the second term, making the whole thing equal 0. This means that these 8 equations imply that the determinants of vectors 7, 8, and 9 equal 0, proving Pappus' theorem. In order to make a connection to conic sections, I'll examine the simplified determinants of vectors 7, 8, and 9 before I subbed in the last two determinants. The key difference is that I'll decide to have the expression still equal 0. I have no mathematical justification for this decision, I just want to see what happens. Then, what would happen if I just replaced any vector with a plotting vector with the coordinates x, y, and 1, and graph the equation? 
I'll arbitrarily choose to replace Vector 6. First, I can multiply out the denominator. But before I actually graph anything, I'll try to determine a general idea of what the graph would look like just from the equation. I'll expand the determinants that contain the plotting vector. The other determinants are constants relative to x and y, so each term is in the form of the product of a constant and two linear polynomials of x and y. This means that the equation is in the form of a quadratic polynomial of x and y equaling 0, which is a conic section. Next, I'll check what happens if the plotting vector equals vector 1. After some rearranging, the left side of the equation simplifies to 0, so vector 1 is a solution to the equation. Then, I'll check the same thing for the remaining four vectors. These four cases also satisfy the equation. This means that I know that the graph of the equation will intersect vectors 1 through 5. And for the sake of symmetry, I can replace any of the other vectors with a plotting vector and still get the same kind of result. Technically, the denominator that I multiplied out can also equal 0. But I don't want the conic section to have holes at where the denominator would equal 0, so I'll still ignore it. This is the equation graphed, but now it is more convenient to show this on the 2D plane. I'll rearrange the equation once more to make it look nicer. As you can see, the five points can move anywhere, and the conic section will always intersect all of them. I can also create part of the Pappas configuration on the five points and the conic section, since the equation technically comes from the collinearity of points 7, 8, and 9. Point 6 can just be any position on the conic section. So, it turns out that the interpolation form of the conic section equation is in the form of a difference of two products of four 3x3 three three determinants equaling zero. This definitely looks nicer than the results of solving for polynomial coefficients from a system of five equations in terms of ten variables. The fact that a conic section can be interpolated from five points is called the Bracken Ridge Maclaurin theorem. However, the conic section equation used for this theorem is this. It has the same properties as the equation that I found, where if I sub in any of the five points, they satisfy the equation, since determinants with two of the same rows always equal zero. This equation also looks neat, but I feel like it feels less natural because it's written using the coordinates of the five points, and not the points or vectors themselves, unlike the other equation. I have a Desmos link of the interpolated conic section equation in the description, where you can move around the five points yourself and see how the conic section changes.